The third session that we are about to study is called the consecration of worship. Now, right at the beginning we said we are defining worship. How many of you can tell me the definition of worship? Nobody, because we haven't defined worship as yet. We reach the definition only in this session. Because what we have seen so far is incomplete. We are building up towards the final definition. And uh, this, in this session we shall define and then refine and finally redefine. And, and we shall approach that slowly. In this session, we do not continue from session 2, but we continue from where we left session 1. And in this session, we are going to focus on the purpose of our creation. We're going to try and understand why we are in this world. Now you are here, young, alive, having a future, something to look forward to. A person who is older than you are, they don't have much to look forward to. A person who has reached 80 and 90, definitely if the coming of the Lord tarries, some of us will be reaching 80 and 90. And then what are you going to look forward to? You'll only be looking back and perhaps regretting many things. Maybe regretting, why did I waste my life? But then what do you look forward to? Is this all life is all about? Vanity. Just live for something in this world and when everything is over, we've done nothing. So we will understand the purpose of our creation. And in this matter of worship, when do we worship God? Where do we worship God? And how do we worship God? And finally, in concluding that, we shall study the consecration of worship. Now, um, any engineers here? Yes, one or two engineers. Any doctors, nurses? All right, praise the Lord. Okay. And uh, any other profession here? All employed and maybe some not yet employed. Now, I've got a few questions for you. Is anybody willing to answer the first question? Anyone who's willing to answer the first question? No, I ask the question, you give me the answer. Okay, anybody willing to answer the question? All right. The question I'm asking you is this. This is a question which has troubled many people. It's not easy to answer it. Even the most brilliant minds, they stumble over this question and they're not able to answer it. But since you volunteered, I'm asking you. <laughs> the question is just three words. And it's this. Who are you? No. That's wrong. I didn't ask you what your name was. I asked you, who are you? Johan is your name. You are called Johan. But who are you? Secondly, why did God make you? You know that God made you. Why did He make you? To be a doctor, an engineer... We just know some answers in our head and it keeps popping up from time to time and very often at the right time. <laughs> the third question is, why are you in this world at this present time? Why are you in this world at this time? You know, we are you know, short-sighted and perhaps our whole sight is limited. We are here in this world, say, for about 60, 70, 80, 90 years. But that's just a few seconds when you compare it to the history of the world. The world has existed for so many thousand years and our existence is just for a moment. In that one moment, why are you in this world? Next question. Where are you going? Are you aware that you are going somewhere? You are growing 
But you must understand you are going somewhere. It's not physically. I'm talking to you about the journey of your soul. You began somewhere. You are going somewhere. And many of us are not aware where we are going. We are heading somewhere. Something is happening to us. We were someplace and there is a progress being made. But my question is, what is your destination? The next question I want to provoke you with is, what are you doing with your life for God? I know you're doing something with your life. But what are you doing with your life for God? I know you may be an engineer, you're a doctor, you're repairing people's bodies, you're repairing a machine, you're doing so many things. My question is, you are here for a moment. Before that moment, we didn't know you. And after that moment, you will be a pleasant memory. People will know you by a little photograph on the wall and say, this person existed at such a time in this world. You were here for a moment. Now, what are you doing with your life for God in that moment? Nextly, are you aware, are you very consciously aware that you are going to die? When I was in India, almost every day we had accidents in the bus where people would hang from the window of a bus, footboard travelers, and there was a warning. No one's supposed to stand there. Every day people would die. And the next day, every bus would have at least 20 people standing there. Do you know why? Because there's this inherent feeling, it's not going to happen to me. They died, it's not going to happen to me. Are you aware that one day, it will be your turn to be in that coffin? One day I am going to die. Have you ever thought about the day when you're going to leave this world? On that day, will you know where you are going? Won't it be too late for you to make decisions on that day? Are you aware that once you leave this world, you're not going to come back to live your life again? You have only one chance to live in this world. And finally, what happens to you after you die? If it's only one moment in this world, if our life is just a brief moment, what is going to happen to us after we die? Now these things are very, 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 very important. And the devil will do anything to prevent you from thinking on these things. By entertaining you. What is entertainment? Diversion. Think of tomorrow. Maybe you've got an interesting program coming up. Maybe next week you're going on a holiday. Think of something. And what does it give you? A pleasant feeling. To take you away from all these questions. A pleasant feeling. Be careful. That's entertainment. It's diverting you from the reality. The truth. Look at a drunkard. He drinks. He drinks to solve his problems. But are his problems solved? They are only worsened. And what does he do to solve the worst problems? He drinks a little more. I remember the story of a man who was so badly addicted to drinking, he couldn't stop. And his family suffered a lot. And he just couldn't stop. One day his only daughter, a very sweet little girl, took very seriously ill. And his wife begged him, said, Please give me some money. I want to go and buy some medicine for this little girl. He says, I'm sorry, I spent it all on drinking. Then she said, All right, I have saved a little bit of money. Can you please go and buy some medicine? She is suffering. So he said, All right. So he went to buy the medicine. On the way, he saw a pub. He had to stop. Can you see? He was bound. He went and he drank. And after drinking, when he came back late, he found that his daughter had died. He was filled with remorse. He was filled with anger and sorrow at what he did. And he, he couldn't forgive himself. And to cut the story short, finally, people came and the funeral service was being conducted. That body was lying there. A sweet little girl 
she was lying dead and her mother was just shocked watching her and the father was shocked and he looked at her and he began to sob and sob what have i done to you it's because of me that this happened to you he was so filled with sorrow he needed a drink can you see the bondage of man he had no money so while no one was looking he pulled off her expensive shoes and he stuffed them into his pocket and he went out for a drink do you know what's happening dear children of god he is bound to drinking and we are bound to fun and entertainment something is always taking us away from the reality of these questions therefore don't let that take us away but keep your mind focused on the questions that were just asked to you all these questions have troubled many brilliant minds now we are going to give you an answer and uh, this answer is going to be so simplistic that you're going to say oh no i'm sure there's something more to it we were born in this world and born again from above with one purpose and that one purpose is to worship our loving god now that is too simple the reason it's too simple for us is because we've become so complicated we can't accept anything simple anymore and that's what saint paul feared he said i'm afraid that you know the serpent will take you away from the simplicity of the gospel but let me tell you you were born to worship god now the whole thing lies in that word worship you have not understood that word worship and that's why you feel it's very simple now i'm going to take you a little deeper into that word worship from two different sources i'm going to teach you that the purpose of our creation is to worship god first of all i will show you from nature from nature i will show you that we have this inherent quality something that god gave us is still within us it's still within the sinner as well though the sinner is estranged from god inside him is still this quality of worship now for example if you see uh the the a, a, a tribal chieftain in say a jungle in africa what does he do you see he stands before a temple or maybe in asia he stands in a temple and he starts worshiping this idol what does he do he starts bowing down and he 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 offers homage and reverence to this idol or you take a man who has a beautiful car he loves his car am i right he loves his car and he can feel something in his heart feeling in the heart and then expressing it in the body i know of a man who loved his car so much every morning he would kiss his car he loved his car and he kissed his car now that is worship because you're having it in your heart and you're expressing it in your body you see he's having the impulse to worship but it's directed in the wrong direction or a teenage girl sitting in her room with a wall plastered with posters of all her idols or maybe a football fan all these people you see they are having their object of worship and they are feeling something in their heart and then they are they are offering that worship to that thing or to that person for a moment just reflect what is your object of worship maybe a few objects of worship it may be a person it may be a thing it may be your profession some people worship themselves how many of you worship yourselves how do you worship yourself when we look into the mirror and we see ourselves beautiful a little more beautiful i want oh i love you we love ourselves self love one of the signs of the coming of the lord is self love men shall be lovers of their own selves self love and doing something to make to do to improve our image we are worshiping ourselves you see this no man is dead in his heart 
Every man has some object or some thing, some person, some place. Some they worship nature. They love nature. Some they love sports. You see, everybody loves something. You also have an object. You can see man is a worshipper by nature. Some people they worship money. Some people worship their jobs. Some people they worship sin. Some people they worship pleasure. You see different gods are being worshipped. They've all departed from the living God. It's true. But that God given instinct to worship remains in his heart. And he tries to worship this God. He tries to worship his money. But he's not satisfied. The God money cannot satisfy him. Mammon cannot satisfy him. Some people try to worship sin. They love sin. And then they give themselves over to sin. And they think that sin will satisfy them. But they find they are not satisfied. So they give themselves more to sin. But they are still not satisfied. Can you see what man is doing? Man is searching for the God whom he can worship. Man is still looking for the God. The sinner who will never understand what we are talking about is actually looking for his God. He is trying different things. He is going from place to place. There are some people who are called train spotters. They worship trains. They love to watch a train move up and down. And we think they are so stupid. But God thinks we are stupid too because we do nothing better. We all have our pet gods whom we worship. The man who has discovered the true God, he is the one who will worship God truly. That is from nature. Now when we look at the word of God, you will see the purpose of our creation, the purpose of your creation, why you are in this world at this moment of time, is to worship God. I will show you two verses. First of all, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21. Isaiah 43, 21. These are important things. Mothers, you say, the purpose of my existence is to care for my children. Yes, definitely you must care for your children. Now, if that is the ultimate purpose, then you have failed in something. You fail to understand what you are here for. You know, there is a deeper purpose for your existence. What do we read in Isaiah 43, 21? Someone read that, please. This people have I formed for myself. This people have I formed for myself. For myself. Dear children of God, for whom were you formed? You were created for God. You were not created for your family. You were not created for your friends. You were not created for your parents. You were created for God. You exist in this world for God. I have made this person. I have made you for myself. You are in this world for me. Carry on. They shall show forth my praise. They shall show forth my praise. They shall worship me. These people have I formed for myself. Now this is the word of God. This is not man's word. This is God's word. And therefore you must understand you are in this world. Not for man. Not for yourself. But you are here in this world for God. That is why I asked you. What are you doing with your life for God? And the verse that we've been uh, reading from time to time. Revelation 4.11 Revelation chapter 4. Verse 11. Somebody read that please. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, they are and were created. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure. Dear child of God, you were created for God's pleasure. This is the purpose of your creation and this is still vague. You're not able to understand how can that be. How many of you can say, my life gives God pleasure. I have lived 40 years, 50 years in this world. And maybe suddenly we'll slip out of this world. Please do not leave this world without fulfilling the purpose of your existence. You may have been good at your work. You may be good as a parent, you may be good as a child, you may be good as a sibling. 
But remember that alone is not the purpose of your existence. Do not find out the purpose of your existence on the day you are going to leave this world. It will be too late. The purpose of your existence is this. You were created to give God pleasure. We have all been made. So what is worship? Worship is giving God pleasure. Our whole life, every cell in our body should be worshipping God. And that is what, that's the message Jesus brought. Jesus brought the message saying, The Father is looking for people to worship Him. The Father is seeking true worshippers. The Father is looking for people. Unfortunately, this message is not getting through to us. Dear children of God, think. God is looking for worshippers. So what should you be? You must be a worshipper of God. You can be a good engineer, a good doctor, you can be whatever. But if you are not a worshipper of God, if you are not fulfilling the purpose of your existence, you are not giving pleasure to God. It is God's will, God's perfect will, that you worship God, not just with your lips. I am going to carry on into the definition of worship. What is worship? Worship is responding to God. We feel in our heart and then we express it in our body. Or... We are responding to God, what, to what He is to us. When we see God is love, we respond saying, Jesus, I love you. Now that is worship. But there is something deeper in worship. We did read in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, that we have to, no, I beseech you therefore brethren, and He says, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, and He ends up saying, this is your acceptable worship. That's one translation. He says, if you want to worship God acceptably, that is, if you want God to say, yes, sister, I love your worship. If God has to accept our worship, he says, you have to present your bodies to God. Now understand this carefully. We all worship God in different measures. Some of us, our worship is very, very shallow. But God wants deep worship from us. He wants quality worship from us. Acceptable worship means the worship which God accepts. Two men brought a sacrifice to God, two brothers. God accepted one, He rejected the other. This scenario is continuing even today. So many of us bring our worship to God. God rejects some, God accepts some. Which worship does He accept? The worship where our bodies are given to God. How do we give our bodies to God? That is, we are yielding our body saying, Lord... I want to do your will. I want to do your will. Dear children of God, I want to tell you, this is very, very important. How you respond with your life to God. This is what you must understand. You are in this world. Your parents, they did not know you before you were born. Your friends, your work colleagues, you give them so much honor and respect. But the only person who knew you before you were born is God. The only person who knew what you would look like is God. The only person who knows what you were created for is God. God made you for a purpose. I remember one brother uh, in India, he, when he wanted to serve God, he said the purpose for which God is going to uh, call me, is because I love to look after the cars in the house of God. So my purpose of existence in the ministry is to look after the cars of the pastors. And he thought till the end he would be driving cars, cleaning cars, washing cars. That was his understanding. But suddenly God revealed his mind to him. And we know the purpose of his existence. He is Pastor Wesley. Can you imagine him sitting in some corner of the world, sitting and cleaning cars? That's what he thought he was doing. And what about you? What are you doing? You're also cleaning cars. Sitting in your little corner, being a little doctor, a little engineer, a little nurse, or whatever. This is my purpose of existence. You did not make yourself. Your maker made you for a purpose. Have you found out what he made you for? The Lord has made you for something eternal. But you have now brought yourself down to a finite being. And you live 
such a shallow life. Dear friend, dear child of God, God has created you to worship Him. Now what is this worship? We are going to understand as we go deeper and deeper. Worship begins with feeling in the heart, expressing it outside. And then we must discover the purpose of our existence. I made these people for myself to worship me. Now God made you with a purpose. There is a calling upon your life for something that you have to do. Do not leave this world without finding out the purpose of your existence. I'm going to carry on now about this worship. By now we know just music and singing is not worship. What is worship? Worship is feeling in our heart and expressing something towards God. That feeling towards God. Now that is worship. Now, when do we worship God or the time and situation of our worship? When do we worship God? Anybody? If I ask a little girl, when do you love your parents? Do you have a timetable? On Monday I love my mom. On Tuesday, I love my dad. On Wednesday, I love my brother. On Thursday, I'm free. I don't have to love anyone. That's when I cause all the trouble. Worship is our love response to God. That means we have to be worshipping God all the time. All the time. But are we doing that? Quite often, maybe it's in the weekend, we remind ourselves, Ah, oh, there is somebody called God. The rest of the week we are not aware of God at all. In the weekend we remember God, alright. Now we have to go to that place because God is sitting there inside a box. I must go and say hello to Him. And then I'll say bye, leave Him in that box and I'll come back to my life. But then Tozer, a man of God says, he says when we worship God on Sunday, we may kneel before God, we may feel the presence of God. He says, on Monday you are back at work. Sitting in your office or wherever you are. If you do not feel the same presence of God that you felt on, Mon on Sunday, your worship is not right at all. The very same presence of God that you feel on Sunday, you must feel on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday every day. And not just in certain hours, but all the time. He has a testimony about himself. He says, all the time I have a sense of heaven around me. I have a sense of heaven around me all the time. I'm going to give, tell you the testimony of one brother, Lawrence. This old brother, he was a very humble and a very simple saint. He had no credentials. He was not known for some talent or that he was a big preacher or a singer or a scholar or and nothing. He was a humble saint of God and in the place where he was, his job was to scrub pots and pans. How many of you think that your job is to scrub pots and pans? Maybe you don't do much more than that. You scrub something. Okay, his job was to scrub pots and pans and he faithfully did that for many years and then he died. Today, 300 years later, people still talk about him. There are books written about him. Why? Because whenever he scrubbed the pot and pan, they were exceptionally clean. Is that why? This man, there was something very, very precious about him. His testimony was this. It was his ambition and it became his testimony. His ambition was this. I must always enjoy the presence of God. I must live in and remain in the presence of God. Or... He said that's life of continual worship. All the time conscious of God. How can we worship God when there's no God? Without an object of worship, how can we worship? So he said, I must always be aware. When I leave this place, I must be aware of God. When I go home, I must be aware of God. When I come to church, it must not be starting something new. I'm just carrying on what I'm doing. This man, in his own words, he says... There is not in this world a life more sweet and delightful than the life of continual conversation with God. The time of my work and my business 
is not different from my time of prayer. While I'm in the kitchen, while I'm doing my work, different people may call me for different things. But there, even in the midst of all my work, I possess the same presence of God that I have when I'm on my knees. He lived like that for so long. And when he was dying, people approached him and they asked him, What are you doing? Or do you know where you're going? He said, I am doing what I have done all through my life and what I am going to do all through eternity. He said, Are you aware that you are dying, Brother Lawrence? He said, Oh, yes. But look here. I am right now blessing God. I am praising God. I am adoring God. I am giving Him the love of my whole heart. My one business, my brethren, is to worship Him and to love Him. And I have no thought of anything else. Worship became his lifestyle. Worship became his life. Dear children of God, when do we worship God? All the time. But then there is a little problem. When problems happen in our life, for example, when you are rebuked by a servant of God or rebuked by your boss or rebuked by your parents or you're facing a terrible problem, what do we do? Can we say, Jesus, I love you, I adore you. How many times we come to God with questions? How many times we come to God with complaints? But you'll understand, if you are a true worshipper of God, you will worship God all the time and you can worship God in every situation. Is that possible? I'm going to show you from the word of God. David, you know what David did? David sinned. David we know, he committed a terrible sin. Now, he had committed the sin and he was sitting in his house. A servant of God approached him and said, David, stand up. You have sinned. Now, David is a respectable man. He's, a, he's an important believer. And now he has been rebuked. What do you think David would do? He was not only rebuked, he was disciplined as well. What happened as part of discipline? He lost his son. His son died. When somebody dear to us dies, we've got a list of 25 questions for God. Why my son? Or why my daughter? Why not that person? Why, why, why this and why that? And so many questions. But if you read the word of God, when prophet Nathan confronted David, David, what did he do? You read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. He confronted David, rebuked him and he went away. And then God took his son away. Now read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. David came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. When? He did this after his son died. Do you understand? Even when God brings discipline into our lives, when God corrects us, some kind of punishment God brings in our life, even there, we can worship Him. How? How is it possible? This is where we must understand there are ingredients of worship. One part, one ingredient of worship is brokenness, humility, submission. Worship is not all dancing before God. Worship is a humbling, true worshipping saints have said, whenever they worship God, they are humbled before God. They are broken before God. So you see here, what did David do in brokenness and humility? That is the inner feeling he was experiencing. He bowed down before God. He was worshipping God and then he surrendered himself to live for God in the future. That is dedication. How about uh, times where you're going to face an exam or an interview or some terrible tension in your family. Something you're expecting. Now tomorrow maybe something terrible is going to happen. Someone's going to come and fight with you. Someone's going to do something to you. What do you do at that time? Sit and cry or go and fight, go argue. The Bible says even when you are in tension, 
you must still worship God. Look at Joshua. He was expecting a battle to take place. And now you read Joshua chapter 5 verse 13 and 14. Joshua chapter 5 verse 13 and 14. You see here, Joshua fell on his face and he worshipped. This is a time of tension. He was anticipating battle, but you see he was worshipping. You can even read the book of Job when you go. I don't think anybody has ever faced Job's trial and I don't think we would survive if we faced his trial. Job lost his job and he lost all his children within the space of an hour. He lost everything. Tell me, if you lose your children, just you've got the news that your family was maybe traveling, 15 members of your family, they were traveling in a car or in a coach, and suddenly they met with an accident, all of them died. Now that's the news that Job received. When Job received the the news of the death of his children and the end of his job, the Bible says his immediate response was, he fell down. And he was worshipping God. He said, God, you have given, you have taken, blessed be the name of the Lord. This is an Old Testament saint. You see, even in the Old Testament, they were like that. This must make us understand something is not yet right with my life. So that is, when do we worship God? Always and in every situation. Then where do we worship God? If it's always... Then where do we worship Him? Everywhere. Anywhere we go. You don't have to be worshipping Him in church alone. If you're going to worship God in church, it's going to be very sad because you're going to leave Him behind in the church. If you're going to worship God and receive an anointing only in the camp, it's very sad because you're leaving your anointing behind. You're leaving God behind in the camp. It's always and everywhere. But I want to take you a little deeper. I want to tell you something very important. I asked you one question in the beginning. After you die, where will you go? Do you know where you're going to go after you die? Don't just say heaven. Even the sinner says that. Do you know that you were created by God to inherit a certain place in heaven? It's like a person has manufactured a plane. He's manufactured it. And now he's kept it in the airport. It's there for a moment. But it's going to go to a certain place. When you look at perhaps the tail. And you see the flag of that particular nation on the tail. You know this plane is destined for this place. But for the moment now it's here waiting in the airport. This is where we are all in this world. We are waiting. But we are destined for a certain place. Can you tell me to which place you are going? Do you know where God is going to take you? He wants you to be. Now, that place physically is maybe in heaven, we say. Yes, a certain place God has kept for me. The thing is, spiritually, we must already be in that place now. Somehow we've gotten to a bad habit of pushing heaven fully into the future. But according to Tozer and Lawrence and so many saints. Now I'm telling you these names. There are many saints in our church also. I, I, I listen to the words of the saints because they have been in the presence of God. True, the Israelites were all at the foot of the mount. But I will listen to Moses because he has been in the fire. He has been in the presence of God. Don't just listen to people at the foot of the mount. Listen to those who have come down from the mount. And they have said this. Heaven is not all in the future. You start enjoying your destination now. If you are called for New Jerusalem, you will start living in New Jerusalem now. If you are called to be in Zion, 
you will start enjoying Zion now. We must not think it's all in the future, all in the future. You will start enjoying now. Some call it the immediate presence of God. Brother Lawrence called it practicing the presence of God. Enoch called it walking with God. But there is something I want to tell you. The place where you are going, that is the place you are already now. You are building up your own destination while you are here. Sinners who are going to hell, they are already building up that hell. That hell is slowly forming around them. Dear child of God, spiritually where are you? Now itself you will be in that eternal destination. In the word of God we see God has set eternity in their hearts. The Bible says you lay hold on eternal life. Dear child of God, if you're going to say heaven is there, somewhere out there, there are so many choruses like that we sing. A mansion over the hilltop, across the bridge, some glad morning, and we just push heaven away. But no, you can start enjoying heaven now. True life of worship is now itself enjoying the presence of God. According to the place where you are going, so will the quality of your worship also be. And then, how do we worship God? The word of God says, you worship Him in spirit and in truth. I remember the testimony of one sister. She said, God, I want to worship you. I really want to worship you, but I don't know how to worship you. Instantly, the anointing fell upon her. She received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and burst out in tongues. That was the answer to her prayer. That tells us something. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit to worship God in the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit will take us into a deep experience. Actually, getting filled in the Spirit, many believers in the UPC do not know what getting filled in the Spirit is. It's just some kind of a mantra, some kind of a thing that you just keep. People get so used to speaking in tongues that I've seen people... They're speaking in tongues and they fall asleep. And while they are half sleepy, their tongues also is a sleepy tongue. And then they wake up, they open their eyes and still speaking in tongues, they look at the clock. And they say, oh, all right. And they're still speaking in tongues and then they close their eyes. What is speaking in tongues? Is it just going on saying something with the mouth? People have reduced the anointing of the Holy Spirit to such a, uh, brought it down to such a level. Getting filled in the Spirit is the, is the New Testament way of worshipping God. It's not just speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is an outward expression. But what does the Bible say? Inward edification. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. There is a work happening inside. Dear children of God, don't just go speaking in tongues. But you must understand that it's an outburst flowing out from your heart. So when the anointing comes, you must feel that inside, there is a deep work happening inside us. And then we speak in tongues. Don't make speaking in tongues just an exercise for your mouth. Or maybe an exercise for your body, moving about a bit, clapping, but you're feeling nothing inside. People who get used to that, they need a song. And the song has to increase in its tempo. And maybe to give them a little push, they need some instruments as well. We should not worship God like that. Worshipping God in the Spirit is important. And worshipping God uh, in the Spirit is also a very deep experience. The Bible tells us, deep calls unto deep. Now, deep means, the first deep is God. God is not a shallow God. God is very, very, very deep. He's a mysterious God. There are depths in God that we do not know. And you also as a human being, there is a depth in you that you do not know. And that depth is your human spirit. There are many verses there, you can read it later. The deep part of you is your spirit. And God is a deep God. And it is God, that deep God who wants to make your spirit communicate with Him. If that link doesn't take place, then your connection with God will be very shallow. Deep calling to deep is worshipping God in the spirit. And then worshipping God in the truth. We've already learned in session 1, one of the ingredients of worship is absolute honesty. 
If you want to worship God, your conscience should be clear. Now if a sister has just shouted at her husband and said, Now look here, I don't care what you think, I'm not going to do that. Do you understand? And she storms out of her house, slams the door, gets into the car, slams the door, drives up to the church, slams the door and comes into the presence of God, nothing more to slam. She comes there and they're singing, I worship you. She will try. I were, but there is a disturbance inside. What do we do when the disturbance comes? We push it out and we slam the door. I worship you. And the Lord knocks gently. My child, no. No, I don't accept that. You have to repent. We open the door and say, Jesus, I'm worshipping you. Don't disturb me. Slam the door. With everything within me. Yes, but you've got a lot of sin inside you. So you can't worship you with everything within you. You have to repent. How many of you repented today? Any of you repented today? What we think is repentance is for the new soul, isn't it? But if you see the message to the seven churches, to five of the churches, the message of Jesus was repent. Repent. Repentance is what? Repentance is not crying. Repentance is a change of mind and a change of heart. Of course, because our mind and our heart changes and we feel sorry for what we have done and we have an inward determination not to do it again, an outward expression is weeping. Some people can cry. Now, for example, if you are rebuked, you can cry. But that crying is more the self being stirred. That is not repentance. Dear child of God, you cannot worship God unless you tell the Lord you are sorry. Lord, I did that to my husband. And then you try to worship God, you feel still incomplete. Because you just grieved your husband, you said something to him. You have to go and tell him sorry as well. I remember my mother, one day she had a little argument with my father. It was only a small thing. She argued with him. And then later she felt very sad that she did that. So first of all she said, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I did. Then she went to my father and said, Please forgive me, I shouldn't have spoken like that. Then she came up to me and said, Please, sorry. I said, No, what did you do to me? She said, No, I know you heard me. So, please, I'm sorry. You can see how she was really sorry. And then when she goes to the presence of God, she's able to worship God. We have to worship God in truth. Our worship should not be Cain's worship. Cain's worship was rejected. Why was Cain's worship rejected? He brought his worship to God. Something was wrong in his worship. In this worship of Cain, we see he brought some flowers to God. He brought some, uh, something from the grounds, maybe some fruit or flowers. Something was missing. I don't want to go into full details, but you see, in the, before Cain was Adam, Adam and Eve also sinned. And then what did they do? They covered themselves with leaves. But God said, take those leaves away. I will give you a coat of skin. Why did God give skin? He had to slay an animal to give them that skin. In other words, that Adam, you sinned. You can't cover up your sin with leaves. Something has to be sacrificed to, to, for your sin. Now Cain came to God. He also brought some leaves and some flowers. No, an animal has to be sacrificed. If you see later, God started teaching the children of Israel. It was a one Abel and one lamb. But later you see, in, the, in, the, in Egypt, God said, one lamb for a family. When you came into the wilderness, it was a lamb for all the children of Israel. And when you come into the New Testament, it is one lamb of God for the whole world. God was trying to show through all the sacrifices that... One day Jesus will come and die. So God wanted every Old Testament sacrifice to be an animal sacrifice. Something had to be sacrificed, but Cain brought his own sacrifice. God rejected it because it was not a blood sacrifice. In other words, you can't worship God 
without accepting the cleansing work of God. So often God says, my child, I'm grieved with you for what you have done, but I will forgive you, I will cleanse you. We don't pay attention to that voice. We carry on stubbornly the way we are, refusing to repent. God hates that worship. Later, after God said, Cain, I don't accept your sacrifice, at least there Cain could have been sorry. Instead, he became angry. He killed his brother. After that, God gave him another chance and said, Cain, I can hear the voice of your brother. And Cain responded, am I my brother's keeper? You can see every time God approached Cain, Cain rebelled against God. He refused to accept God's decision. You see, Cain's sacrifice would not be accepted. Thirdly, the reason why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted was because by bringing just flowers, bringing an easy offering unto God, we are not treating our sin seriously. We can see later also he did not treat his sin seriously. He treated it very lightly. How did he treat it lightly? He said, the discipline that you gave me is far more severe than it should be. In other words, my sin is not so serious. Sometimes we treat our sin very lightly. Dear children of God, all these are wrong kinds of worship. God wants pure worship. Worship in the beauty of holiness. I am now approaching the end. Let me once again tell you what worship is. Worship in the beginning we understood is feeling in the heart. And then expressing it in the body. God loves worship but there is one more thing about worship. It is surrendering ourselves to do the will of God. That is to fulfill the purpose of our creation. It is feeling expression and then dedication you may feel in your heart how many of you say i love jesus oh i love jesus hallelujah for jesus and then you go back and do your own will your worship is incomplete what is worship worship is feeling in the heart expressing it in the body and then if our worship has to be acceptable worship it is dedicating ourselves saying god let your will be done in my life. Now, I'm going to finally define worship. Worship is more than just feeling and expression. It is the life of dedication to God's will that comes from a heart of worship. I worship God. I love God. I love Him so much. I clap for God. I sing for God. I jump for God. I bow before God. I weep before God. I pray unto God. Yes, but because I love Him so much, I dedicate my life to do His will. No point just saying I love God. God said, Abraham, you offer Isaac on the altar. What did Abraham do? We see Abraham said, we will go worship and come. Abraham was willing to do the will of God. We say, no, I won't do your will, but I will continue to worship you. That's wrong worship. Worship has feeling, worship has expression, and worship has dedication. I ask you, believer in Christ, are you doing the will of God with your life? You are doing somebody's will. It may be the will of your parents, maybe the will of your spouse, it may be the will of your friends. It may be your own will, maybe even the devil's will. But I'm asking you, are you doing the will of God? Are you in this existence, in this world, fulfilling the purpose of your creation? Only if you are doing the will of God is your worship complete. And that is the third session. Consecration of worship. That is the ultimate part of worship is consecration of worship this word consecration means setting something aside as unto god saying it no longer belongs to me now god says my daughter consecrate this that means something that belongs to you god wants you to consecrate it means say it no longer belongs to me it belongs to god if i handle it i will handle it as something that belongs to god now for example Samson's mother. She was a normal mother like you. She had a son whom she had to bring up. But God said no. Samson is consecrated. In other words, he is your son. But you must bring him up as my son. 
So Samson's mother was so careful. I can't fulfill my purpose concerning Samson. I'm handling him as God's property. Hannah knew that Samuel belonged to God. So she knew I have to give him back to God. He was a consecrated son. The Old Testament Levites, they were consecrated. John the Baptist, his food and his clothing. He said, I can't just eat anything. I can't dress any old way. Because I've consecrated my body unto the Lord. You see, John the Baptist, if he lived in this world as a musician, he would not be fulfilling the purpose for his existence. His purpose for his existence was to be a forerunner of Jesus. So he loved God. He worshipped God by consecrating his life to do the will of God. And he said, as part of that consecration, my clothes had to be consecrated. In other words, I can't dress as I like. How many of you have really entered a real life of worship in consecration? Even in these days, many children of God, according to the revelation God is revealing, they are making consecration. Some, they consecrate their free time. Some, when they have free time, they say, I want to go on a holiday. I want to go and have some fun with my family. I want to go and have fun. I want a weekend off. I want to go with my friends. Some people, they go about doing anything and everything. On Sunday, they come and they prophesy. Some people say, oh God, I love you. Once and the next time, they're doing their own will. But there are some believers, they say, God, I consecrate my free time. What does that mean? The free time I have, I can't do my own will. That is God's time. They use it maybe to distribute tracts or they go to the house of God and they help in the house of God. In some places, believers have consecrated their homes for gospel meetings. They put up with so much inconvenience. Some people, they say, even though they are married, they say, we consecrate our life for God. You see, these are different levels of consecration according to their calling, according to the revelation God gives them. So worship is not just clapping, saying something, feeling something. Worship is a response. It is an act of making a consecration out of a life that worship God. Dear child of God, you may worship God in clapping your hands. But if you do not make a consecration, that is not worship. Worship is complete only if it has three points. One, feeling. Secondly, expressing. Thirdly, it is dedication. Therefore, I am coming now to the final definition of worship. Worship. What is worship? Worship is feeling and then responding physically and then dedicating. If I have to bring it down to a simple statement, worship is loving the Lord. Loving Him means responding yes and then dedicating to serve the Lord according to His will for us. As a believer, you must serve God in some way. This is the commandment of God. He says, the first commandment was, you should not bow down before idols or serve them. Jesus used that against the devil saying, you must worship the Lord only and serve Him only. So what is this worship? Worship is loving the Lord and then serving the Lord. Dear believer, you think only servants of God should serve God. But I am telling you, as a believer, if you want to be a true worshipper of God, it's not enough if you just jump and say, God, I love you. If you are not serving God with your life, you may be serving your boss, you may be serving your spouse, serving your children and serving yourself. But unless you serve God according to the will of God, dedicate your life, you are not worshipping God. Worship is our personal and sacred relationship with Jesus. We, we love Him. We express that love. And then we express it more and more so much. Finally, Lord Jesus, You died for me on Calvary. I want to do something with my life for You. That is worship. We are now going to conclude with the highest form of worship that has ever, ever existed. Church history has left us with incredible testimonies of many men and women who were great worshippers of God. Some of their names have been mentioned in the syllabus. Brother Lawrence, Frederick Faber, Tozer. These are all saints. And in the Bible we David and Paul. These are all saints. According to the word of God, there is the greatest and the highest and the most glorious form of worship ever. 
That is, somebody or a group of people who love God, they say, God, I love you, and then they make a dedication. Now, to avoid the confusion, I'm now going back to the familiar terminology that UPC is used used to. Instead of saying worship is feeling and expressing and dedication, worship is loving the Lord and serving the Lord. The highest form of worship is Zion. The highest form of worship. Zion is the name given to the service or the worship of a group of people who out of their deepest love for God are willing to make the consecration of serving Him as mentioned in Luke 14.26. That is, they consecrate not their food and their clothes are one thing. They consecrate everything and they consecrate themselves also. About them we read in the Word of God. Uh, Blessed are those who dwell in thy house. They shall always be worshipping thee, still be praising thee. Their service to God is called Zion. The servants of God who do this are called Zion. Their consecration is the consecration of Zion. The place where they serve Him is Zion. Their destination is Mount Zion. Dear children of God, this is the highest and the deepest service possible, worship possible. That is why we read in Mount Zion finally, the whole mystery of their life will be unraveled as a song. And with musical instruments. It's not that they're going to be harping with harps and singing in Zion. But the life they lived is a song. And the ministry they performed is the musical instrument. And in Zion they will sing a song which no man knows. Which no one else can sing. Dear child of God, you may be perhaps single or maybe you're married. I am not saying you are called unto Zion. I do not know about your calling, but you should know about your calling. You must know what your purpose of existence is in this world. John the Baptist, he was not born by the will of flesh and blood. If you are a child of God, in John 1 we read, they are born not of the will of the flesh. It's not because your parents planned you, you are here. About John the Baptist, we read, he was sent from God. You must have a revelation about your life. You are not here because somebody wanted you here. You are sent by God. If you are sent by God, you are sent with a purpose. Finding out the purpose of your existence and fulfilling it, that is worship. What is worship? Worship is not just serving God. You know, as a servant of God, I can say, Oh, I love to preach, I love to teach, I love to sing, so I want to serve God. That is wrong. That is the worship of the singing and the preaching and teaching. Real worship is loving God and saying, Jesus, I love you. And now I dedicate my life to fulfill your purpose. Dear child of God, only one life and soon it will pass. Don't leave this world with the name. He was a doctor. He was a very good engineer. He used to make this and he used to make that. Oh, she was a beautiful artist. She would paint beautiful pictures. We are going to leave something behind us when we go. But please, dear child of God, don't leave this world like a person of the world. The people of the world, they leave such a testimony behind. But you leave the testimony behind that you discovered why you were in this world and you dedicated your life. In other words, let us leave this world as true worshippers of God. When we leave like that, we shall forever continue in eternity continuing to love our God, continuing to serve our God forever and ever and ever, being true worshippers of God. Shall we stay?